So today, Dr. Scholz, I thought we could break down how prostate cancer metastasizes and specifically where it goes in the body. We've been talking about that, but today I want to talk about lymph nodes. So first of all, what Gleason score would one have to have in order to even have lymph node metastases? It's very reasonable to equate Gleason scores and lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are the uh, small little immune system congregations of cells in our that are throughout our body, but we're always thinking about the ones near the prostate because that's the location of where, if prostate cancer spreads, where it's going to show up in the lymph nodes. And that uh, is a watershed event. The reason that we're nervous about cancer is uh, its potential for spread, and some cancers can't spread. The Gleason score is the best way to predict uh, whether any specific individual's cancer is likely to spread or not. And the absolute minimum Gleason score for something to have the capacity to spread is a seven. And the risk of spread then starts going higher and higher as you go up to eights, nines, nines and tens. So the Gleason score historically has been the best way to predict spread because prior to the advent of PSMA PET scans, we didn't have accurate methods for detecting spread. So we would always uh, profile people project the, the uh, likelihood of spread based on what the Gleason score was. And to answer your question, people need a Gleason score of at least seven before they uh, can even anticipate any possibility of spread, even though with sevens, particularly three plus fours, uh, the possibility of spread is pretty low. And so some men with three plus four are still doing active surveillance because although there's a small risk of spread, it is actually a very small risk, and uh, those individuals are more nervous about the side effects of treatment than they are about the possibility of spread. So sort of a long answer, I know, but uh, it is an important area. Some of the industry, like with pharmaceutical companies or physicians, some people say that METs in the lymph nodes um, is metastatic activity, and then some people say it's non-metastatic activity, which could be very confusing for the patient. The language is super important there. So is there a certain number of METs that have to be present within the lymph nodes for it to be metastatic? Historically, if any metastasis had occurred, if you go back 10, 20, 30 years, it was generally thought that that was incurable and that there would be always more and more metastasis showing up sooner or later. Well, as our technologies improve and as we're catching metastasis at earlier and earlier stages, we're learning that that's not always the case. And in particular, the people that have a very limited number of lymph nodes that are close to the prostate with modern radiation, hormones, and other measures, some of those people are, will be cured. They uh, are no longer in this hopeless sense that uh, that it's an inevitable uh, future of progression and cancer growth. So I think that's the, the, uh, the root of the confusion, is that, yes, we think of metastasis historically as being uh, this, this monumental event that uh, now someone who's curable has been uh, converted into someone who's incurable, and that historically was the perspective. But we know that with new technology that we are curing people with metastasis and the people that are more likely to be cured are the ones that have lymph nodes in a limited number that are close to where the prostate used to be down in the pelvis. So when it comes to treating lymph node metastasis, you know, we hear, um, you know, about spot radiation and things like that. So how many METs is too many METs to spot radiate? The cutoff number that's thrown out for oligometastatic diseases is, is uh, less than five or less spots. But that needs to be tempered by the fact that we can talk about regions. Sometimes they, there may be three or four lymph nodes in one area and then three or four lymph nodes in another area, which could be easily encompassed in a radiation field. There would be exceptions to uh, the idea that you can't go after metastatic disease if there's more than five spots. But that gives you a sort of a rough context that if there's more than five or six metastatic spots, the idea that we're going to get long-term control by radiating them all starts to diminish, but people's treatment does need to be personalized uh, according to their, their age and what we know about the history of the disease and what other treatments have already been given, but uh, the general threshold is five. If someone has tumors in their prostate, then there is a small amount of METs that have reached the lymph nodes. Is it, you know, we have these systemic treatments and these hormone therapies that go through our entire body. Is it absolute that they do need to get hormone therapy if there is any lymph node activity? Well, again, historically, that, the answer was yes. Uh, and the reason was that our scans were so bad at detecting all the spots, we always assumed there were additional spots that we weren't picking up, and therefore the hormone treatments and the chemo treatments were given to try and 
treat those smaller spots that we weren't seeing. Now with the better scanning techniques available through uh, PSMA PET scans, it is conceivable to just treat the spots with radiation and see if the PSA goes down to zero uh, before piling on with additional layers of hormone treatment. Use of hormone treatment in conjunction with radiation to the lymph nodes is um, certainly a, an important discussion point, and uh, the use of hormone treatment needs to be individualized from patient to patient. There are many factors, I think, that too many to go into right now in terms of deciding if a person could do just radiation to the lymph nodes and see how it goes, or whether they should do radiation to lymph nodes plus systemic therapy to cover for the possibility of other met metastatic sites, systemic therapy being hormone treatment for six to 24 months, possibly with combinations, uh, first and second generation hormone therapies, chemotherapy medicines. So yes, there is a, uh, still a role for an aggressive systemic approach, but it's not as black and white as it used to be. So, you know, there are many different types of radiation out there. Is there one type of radiation that's better at treating lymph nodes than another? We're looking at usually at beam radiation, which can be proton, uh, short course, stereotactic body radiation, long course, intensity modulated radiation. I think that the similarities between these options are much more than the differences. Uh, there's a convenience factor if you can get the treatment done in five visits with SBRT res rather than 25 visits with IMRT. But in terms of anti-cancer efficacy, I think they're about the same. So we have side effects when we treat the prostate. We know that there are particular side effects that can happen. Are there any side effects to when you treat lymph nodes? Well, it's interesting how that has evolved because in this modern era, the treatment of lymph nodes should be associated with very few, if any, side effects. But if you go back 10, 15 years when they couldn't target as well, lymph node radiation was a dreaded type of treatment. And uh, many of the radiation therapists decided not to do it at all because they saw such horrible toxicity when the radiation would hit the intestines and the bladder. So it is really a, a big turnaround. If you think of how weighty that word radiation is, it, it's, it's not a pretty word. Uh, people don't want to have radiation. Um, it's really a, a result of the radiation that was given in the 1990s where there was a lot of overspray, normal organs were hit, and a lot of real, really unfortunate things happened. That is no longer the case. If you're at a state-of-the-art center with modern equipment and if the doctors are up to date in terms of the latest thinking, m my impression with the uh, side effects of radiation is the uh, patient may have some transient fatigue, uh, but other than that, not much. If somebody has um, lymph node involvement when they are diagnosed versus somebody who has lymph node metast you know, metastatic disease in the lymph nodes when it's recurrence, is it treated differently? Generally, when people are being treated for the first time, there's this thought of, let's get it all this time, one and done. We don't want to come back and have to deal with recurrences. And the treatment mindset will probably be more, more aggressive. Systemic hormone therapy, maybe even a short course of chemotherapy. Of course, treat the disease in the prostate and get rid of that as well with radiation usually. If someone's having a recurrence, especially if there's been a long time period uh, between when they were treated and now uh, PSA is creeping up and they find a lymph node somewhere, uh, the need to repeat all the systemic therapy is not as well established. Uh, it's more attractive maybe just to treat the lymph node, see if the PSA goes down to zero, treat the lymph node with some radiation, see if the PSA goes down to zero, and then consider further treatment based on what kind of, uh, how, the, how the situation evolves. Uh, it, if the PSA doesn't go to zero, get another PSMA PET scan. If it looks like you're dealing with, wrestling with a disease that isn't being controlled with spot radiation, then yes, of course, systemic therapy is always the fallback position. But I don't think it's uh, quite the same for uh, some of recurrent disease as someone who is newly diagnosed Newly diagnosed, we're really swinging for the fence. We want to eliminate the disease completely, and if we're finding lymph nodes at the time of diagnosis, we know we're dealing with a potentially much more dangerous disease. We don't know how it's gonna play out over time, and precautions with additional uh, hormone therapy and possibly chemotherapy should be at least discussed. You know, from hearing you speak about this, it seems like there's a lot of options for patients who have lymph node involvement, whether or not they were diagnosed or whether or not it's a recurrence. Can you speak to that? Because I know that there can be a lot of anxiety when it comes to the thought process that the cancer has left the prostate and it's no longer localized. Well, the reasons for anxiety are well-founded. One is with most other cancers, we don't have the many treatment options like we do with prostate cancer. So 
lymph node cancer is a very serious development, especially with other types of cancers. It can also be serious with prostate cancer, but we're learning now with the earlier initiation of effective therapy that durable responses and even cures are getting more and more common. So the worrisome aspects of very widespread prostate cancer uh, can't be ignored, and what we're trying to do when people are in the lymph node stage is eliminate it get it under control so that it never does progress into those more serious stages. Today we talked about prostate cancer that is metastasized to the lymph nodes. Now I know this could be a scary proposition because it's no longer localized, but as you heard Dr. Scholl say, whether or not you were diagnosed with lymph node involvement or it's a recurrence and you found the lymph nodes after you know, you've already had treatment, there's a lot of options out there. So I do want to point out that there's hope. There's a lot of things that you can do. And the best thing that you can do right now is to educate yourself as much as you can, know your options, and then discuss those options with your medical team. Now I know you heard me say this a lot, but those educated conversations change the game. They change the outcome and how treatment will follow afterwards, but also the side effects and the lifestyle issues that you may encounter throughout that whole process. Education is the best way to get the best treatment. It's not an absolute that, you know, nothing's going to go wrong, but it's the best way to keep all of the factors that could go wrong as minimal as possible. So thank you so much for watching this channel. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like more information about your prostate cancer case, you can visit our website, pcri.org and talk to our helpline. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer videos every week and I hope you have a great week, but please above all, remember you're not alone.